All right, this mic is probably gonna die. That's fine, but if, I, if it does die, then I gotta put that camera in my face because the microphone on that camera probably could pick up a mouse farting from 50 yards. So if I have to use that mic with this ocean behind me, I'll have to pull it in. So I'm gonna not waste any time and get right to it, you guys, all right? From the beginning of the West Coast Trail of Vancouver Brown, I've been getting beat up straight behind me about, I don't know, 15 to 20 miles that way daily in the boat. It's a beautiful place here. I can't get enough of it. All right. Hi Steve, I'd like to let you know that I love your channel. I'm addicted to everything Sasquatch, although I haven't seen one for myself. I'm amazed at how many people I know personally that have. I'm from the coast of BC, First Nations. I grew up with my mother and older brother who spent their whole lives harvesting from the land and ocean. My mother's now 75 years old and still going strong out in the boat. Her life revolves around harvesting salmon, clam, seaweed, herring eggs, seal and deer. Sounds healthy to me. My mother told me about an incident that happened when they were setting up camp while getting ready for sockeye salmon food fishing. My brother dropped her off on an island they usually camp on. She's setting up the tarp, tying it up on the trees. All of a sudden she was hit with something so fast that she didn't see what hit her. She had extreme pain above her right elbow which resulted in a huge bruise. She looked around and didn't see anything and all she could think it could be a ghost. When she told me, I got the goosebumps. I told her there's probably a Sasquatch through a rock at her. I think she had to tell herself, herself that so she would not be scared off. My brother is an avid hunter and fisherman. On one of his hunting trips, him and his cousins were approaching Kennedy Island and heard the Sasquatch scream from high in the forest. They knew instantly what it was and just turned around to go hunt a different area. My son was working on night shift on the mainland. He, was parked, he parked his dump truck waiting to be loaded. He was laid out across the front seat when he started hearing stones hitting the truck. He just listened as it started hitting the driver's side of the door on the window. He kind of froze in fear. He kind of froze in fear knowing that only one thing in the night can throw stones. He sat up and started the truck and carried on working. A few nights later as he was driving the same truck and going to get loaded, as he was passing by a parked excavator he saw it. It was huge as he said, he could see it standing slash swaying behind the excavator. He said it felt like his blood in his body instantly turned cold. He actually called me on the phone right after the sighting. I told him to take pictures as he drives by the excavator again, mostly to make it go away, knowing that they don't like cameras. He didn't want to say anything to his co-workers for fear of ridicule. He knows to say they were buttheads about it and asked what he was smoking. He went, he went to day shift a week later. That definitely eased my worry. I presently live in Alberta and working on getting back to the coast of beautiful BC. Thank you. Sincerely, an avid listener. Hey man, thanks for that share. And you know what? That's not a first either with the stones, little pebbles getting thrown at a vehicle. There's an account of a, a welder here in Vancouver Brown that worked for a logging outfit. And uh, he went down, I think the one story I read or heard, I think I read it. He went down logging road, was working on a gate welding. A small rock started hitting the hood of his truck and then he felt freaked out and he saw three deer heads from black-tailed deer that had been tore off laying on the ground and he got in his truck he's like I'm out of here got in his truck turned around to leave and went around the corner he just saw one of these things going across the road on an angle and down into the into the uh, the logging cut with regrowth in and disappeared but that's very interesting stuff and uh, thanks for sending that in and if you can if you have any more knowledge you want to share with us, especially from your mom, please get her to share and send it in to us here, okay? At tellmystoryhowtohunt.com or sharemystoryhowtohunt.com and we'll get to it and we'll really, really appreciate it, especially if your mom has more stuff, more knowledge she could share with us, okay? Now, I hate it when I'm running out of freaking batteries. It makes me read fast. It makes me not say things I probably wanted to say. But here we go. Alright, here we go. Message preview red. 
As promised, Mojave Desert, Estes Park, Cheeseman Lake, and Woodland Park. Steve, this is long. Might have to break into another email. I've been tied up the last few weeks. Sorry it took so long to send this. I previously sent you pictures of a very large creature in the Mojave Desert. Here are a few pictures of the tracks upon the ridge line. The black rock in the picture is the size of my chest. I presented these pictures to the DNR and NPS at a training seminar in Phoenix, Arizona in 2020. They couldn't identify them, but took the information and location. As you're a professional guide and tracker, I believe you may have a fresh outlook on possibilities. Keep in mind there is no large predators in this area. Number one, Estes Park, Colorado, 1994. On a fishing trip in the dead of winter, a friend of mine and I decided to try Estes Lake for some large lake trout. Almost blizzard conditions as we arrived, but said, screw it, let's fish anyway. His truck got stuck, falling through the ice on the, bar on the park road. Kind of funny, but not. Figured we fish and then deal with the truck. Climbed the ice, covered the hill up the road to the lake. Important detail for later. We made the lake, slipping and sliding, but no worries. We fished for about two hours, having the best luck ever. We packed up our gear and headed back down the ice hill. Sliding and failing, falling all the way. To our right was a line of large bushes all the way down. I'm six feet tall and these bushes are a few feet taller. About a third of the way down, we heard crunching behind the bushes. When we stopped, it stopped. Getting spooked, we tried going faster, only to slip and fall constantly. About to the bottom of the icy hill, my friend yelled, screw this, and started running. I turned to my right to see something coming through the bushes. I nearly shit myself and I realized this thing was taller than the bushes. I dropped the fishing gear and fish and ran for my life. I caught my friend and yelled faster as I passed him. I heard him say, son of a bitch. Looking back as so I got to his truck, all I saw was a huge figure standing in the road by our gear. We got in the truck that was still stuck in a half foot of ice and he slammed into 4x4 low, flooring it. Still stuck, I jumped out and started hand digging out the tires. It finally lurches out and I dive in as we fly down the park road. The last thing we saw of the creature was him standing, still standing there. Cheeseman Lake, Colorado, 94. Another friend of mine, retired army, we used to go fishing and hiking throughout Colorado every two weeks. My favorite spot was Cheeseman Reservoir. The hike to one of our favorite spots is about four miles up and down the mountains, elevation around 9,500. One particular trip, we started our hike carrying 100 quart cooler and a ton of fishing gear. Walking up the steep trail, singing the Manly Men song, as we rounded the bend, we saw fresh bear tracks. These tracks were bigger than any I'd seen. Next, we heard grunting coming from behind the huckleberry bushes. We've encountered bears before, but this thing sounded bigger. We turned back down the trail, moving fast, singing our manly song much faster, turning back occasionally to make sure we were not followed. As we neared the parking area, I turned and looked back up the trail. Standing there about 100 yards away wasn't a bear or a man. A very tall and wide, dark-haired creature. My buddy looked back and just said, we always wanted to see one, now we have. Let's get the hell out of here. Woodland Park, Colorado, 9395. Living at the bottom of Pikes Peak Mountains, around 7,000 feet, it was always a beautiful morning. My job allowed me the time and ability to explore all the mountains of Colorado. Talk about a dream job. Working special projects, I was tasked with a lot of research and explorations throughout the Rockies. You may think this is insane. I never once carried a firearm during any of these tracks. Been a time or two I wish I had, but as things worked out, a gun would have made things much worse. Instead of recounting all my trips, I'd like to cut to the chase and tell you what I know and what I think. Number one, I know. Bigfoot and other cryptids are very real, personally witnessed on more than a few occasions. Number two, the government knows of their existence and hide it all at all cost. More than 60 years this has been going on. Number three, the briefings given both military and government employees working these projects are as follows. Number four, if encountered, do not engage. Observe and report. All information is a need to know. All right. Number three, the briefings given both military and government employees working these projects are as follows. If encountered, do not engage. Observe and report. All information is on a need to know.
Any release of facts, evidence, or encounters to unauthorized personnel can have grave consequences, including fines, imprisonment, and loss of pension. Number five, all matters concerned thereof are considered matters of national security. Number six, Fort Lewis, Washington, Fort Hood, Texas, Fort Carson, Colorado, Eglin, AFB, Florida are very high profile bases for cryptids. I've worked at all four of these bases, both military and civilian. Military and government contractors are advised and briefed indirectly, I think. Number one. Oh, this is, and then it's titled, I think. Number one, I personally think our government is afraid if people really knew what these creatures are and capable of. It would cause mass panic. Large groups of heavily armed men searching the forest. Lots of accidental shooting and fires. Hmm. Number two, missing people. Huge fan of David and have contacted him in the past. I'm almost positive the government knows what's going on. Just not able to get confirmation from a few colleagues that are involved. Fuckers. I hope they see this. Number three, being involved in a few searches, I think the evidence is available. I plead with those who know me to step up with what proof they have. Number four, there are a few people out there that have, that have come forward and paid the price for it. So be it. It's your duty as a human being to put all this on the table. Please. Number five, I know to keep secrets and believe me, it's necessary at times to protect humanity, but enough is enough. The dangers these beings represent, not all, outweighs the oath you took. Lastly, I promised those in the know I would keep the names private for their protection. Please understand that I shall not keep that pledge much longer if you do not divulge your information soon. As Steve stated, use a secure email. The people have a right to know. All those that know me also know my situation. I don't have anything to lose. I don't have all the answers, but I do know enough. Please step up. Okay, I've rattled on long enough. Thanks for the outlet. Share or don't. Believe or don't. Take what you wish and leave the rest. Thanks for your time, Steve. You're making a difference, my brother. More to follow if you'd like. Best, Otis. More to follow if I'd like. Yeah, yeah, more to follow. You keep keep dumping it, man. Get it to me and I'll get it out to the people. Keep it coming. It's the only way we're going to learn. It's the only way we're going to learn. It's the only way that many of us are going to have a... It's the only way that many of us are going to have a fair crack at living an absolute fulfilled life experience here. All right? And it's absolutely not fair that there are human beings here blocking so many human beings from having a fair crack at knowledge during this lifetime. Right? But anyway, thanks again. Keep it coming in. All right, and just like that, I'm back at home. And um, I had to cut that video short that evening on the beach. And probably just a couple minutes after I shut the camera off right there, um, I ran into what I think I would consider a new friend, First Nations guy, and he follows the channel and recognizes him. We he came out real friendly guy. Came and talked to me for a bit, and uh, he was on his way to a place called Port Renfrew with his family to go do uh, some drumming, storytelling with the other First Nations communities there. And uh, he grew up in Port Alberni. And we were BSing along. And, and uh, then, of course, we got on the topic of, of these things. And I just said, so you have much, uh, many experiences with Sasquatch around here? And he goes, oh, yeah. And uh, he said one time he was driving from Port Alberni to Banfield, nighttime, and uh, with his daughter. And all of a sudden, what he basically described as a chunk of log that no human could ever throw came hurling out of the timber, coming at him to hit the vehicle. And he had to swerve to miss it. And he couldn't figure out what the hell. He said he backed up and got out and took a look at it. And uh, he said it was pretty creepy. It felt creepy. He said there's no way a human being could have tossed that anywhere, let alone from uh, deep in the timber flying out on the road. And they told me of another time, him and two other guys, they were the first people to go down the West, West Coast Trail to open it up and do work on the trail. And there, there's a cabin, I think he said halfway along the trail. And they're in the cabin and something started beating on the side of the wall in the nighttime with them in the cabin. And he said it was pretty, 
pretty freaky moment. But um, it's funny when you talk to people, you know, in places that I frequent, like, you know, the island or here in the mountains or anywhere in the mountains across BC and you start talking to people. Just matter of fact, straight up um, on this topic, it's it's so common. It is so common to hear of people's experiences and they normally wouldn't even talk about it, right? It's just so bizarre just how common it is. And then the more you realize that, the more you realize just how much of a massive effort has been laid down to ensure that we do not get to openly discuss this publicly for some weird reason with with the people of the world. It's it's really weird. You know, like I always say, I'm not a member of the Bigfoot Sasquatch community, and I'm not. I'm a member of the people. I'm just a person on the face of the earth like the rest of you. And I realize the importance, mostly due to this topic. Like I said, when, when you see one of these beings firsthand, I wouldn't say not everybody, but for the most part for me and many others, you instantly realize that we are being absolutely lied to and misled. There's no way out of it because you you see it, you understand it's very real, and then you understand that every single person, basically, maybe not every single one, but the majority of them, who has a story and encounter, they are telling the truth. And then you start, and then you just keep going. You just keep going and wondering why, and you start asking questions, more questions, more questions, and you start to break free away from the program that we've been on for I don't know how long, right? And uh, I guess I'm babbling a little bit. had a couple copies so far. (laughs) But uh, my drive is to, is for the people. There's, it's, I've, I've come to realize since we started doing this in this channel that the voices of all the people are the most important. And I, and I firm believe, and I have, I think I've proven with this channel what we're doing that when you give a certain person or a group or a couple of people the authority on a topic, that's when we all get screwed. Right? Prove me I'm wrong. That's when they make it about them. They make their views the view or no other views allowed. They censor people's speech and it just goes the wrong direction. But the more I do this, the more I realize that this is the route to truth is listening to the people. Right? No one else. The people. That's who we are. Anyway, I guess I'm going a little... I'm getting a little bit of babble on. But, uh, yeah, just getting back to just how common it is. If you were to just look people in the eye, be straight up, respectful, and talk matter of fact, the amount of people that have these experiences is absolutely overwhelming. And I hope I run into my friend, my new friend from Puerto Bernie in the near future um, I'd like to talk more with him and more with other people about this topic around that specific area as well but anyway so I'm inside it's going to be hot air than hell out today and I'm just going to rattle off a handful more emails to tack on to that previous one we did at the beach and I threw down a bunch of west coast content that I filmed over the past and yeah, there's a watermark on it. I explained to the community page that a bunch of my content's showing up on Instagram pages and stuff with people claiming they don't know where it came from. But check this out. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, ah, oh, well, it kind of jumped from my YouTube channel onto your social media page. So anyway, um, that's what the watermark is about. All right, you guys? Um, anyways, listen to this. Let's just get in some emails. I've babbled enough. All right, listen to this one. Three different types of of encounters. The title. Hello, Steve. I've had three different types of experiences. The first one was when I was 12. A buddy invited me to go camping with him and his family in their bumper pole camper. So we get to the campsite just after dark. My friend's mom and dad decided to go for a walk, and we stayed in the camper playing cards. All of a sudden, we feel as if we're being picked up and then dropped. We look at each other with the look of, did you feel that? The blinds were open on the side so we could see out. The next thing I know, there is a giant head in the window. To give you some scale, this is from the emergency exit window. The head took up a third of it. I was less than four feet from it. 
We locked eyes for what felt like one or two minutes. There was probably two seconds. We surprised each other as we both made the same face. Eyes wide open, mouth drops. Then it fades into black. For the longest time, I thought it was some kid playing a prank with a large monkey-like face. Did it scare me? Hell yes, it scared me. It wasn't until years later that I realized what I'd actually seen was Bigfoot. About a minute went by and his parents came back. His dad said we weren't staying. The smell was god-awful, like death. So we went back home, and we've never talked about what we saw. The second and third experiences happened on the same trip, but different days. At the time, I was in Boy Scouts, and we were doing our 50 miles of float badge up on Lake Erie. Day two in, we get to our campsite. I needed to take care of business, so I set out to the latrine, which is about 100 feet from the camp in the woods. Picture this. No doors, no walls, just a fiberglass tub with a seat molded into it. It's dead silent. No birds, no bugs, nothing. So I sit down. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm being, like I'm prey being stalked. I try to hurry as fast as I can. I'm being watched, but from behind me. The camp is 100 feet away. I never saw it was watching, but I know what it was. It made no noise of any kind. It just watched me. No animal would give up a perfect setup like this. I'm defenseless. My back is to you. I can't see it coming. If it had been a predator, I would be dead. And you'll say I made it out alive. Number three, day four. The area we were canoeing was broken up into many streams and small lakes. They were connected by walking trails. We would send two people as scouts down the trails to make sure it was safe. No downed trees and large game on the trails. Had to get away with a 90-pound pack on your back. Me and our guide headed off to check the trail. We get about halfway there and he shoves me to the ground behind a tree and says, Quiet, don't say a word. And he kneels beside me. A few seconds go by and I ask what he saw. He says, Sasquatch, under his breath. I said, I want to see. And he shoves me against the tree and says, I'm not dealing with your nightmares. Then he says, Oh shit, he sees me. My heart is racing. I stay silent. I wait for the guide's next move. He has clearly seen these before and been told not to say anything. A few more secs go by and the guide says, he's gone. We head back and I'm told not to say anything about it ever. I didn't tell the other scouts or the group leader. I don't know what they would have believed me. I don't, I don't know if they would have believed me anyway. The guide said he was 10 feet tall. So the Boy Scouts know about these things and isn't telling the truth about them either. We weren't the only group to have action on that trip. Another group had a boulder thrown at them and it put a hole in the canoe. Luckily, no one was hurt. Thank you for all you're doing on this topic. You're a beacon of light on these things and are helping a lot of good people. Thank you for your time, John. Wow. Well, that's kind of different, eh, John? What a crazy experience, man, especially being four feet away from one of the damn things and look it in the eye. Yeah, I wouldn't crave that one. But is it amazing how many times we hear the same thing? Don't say a word to anyone. I hope everybody realizes just how wrong that is at this stage of the game, right? you got to reverse that. It's time to tell everybody everything. Thanks again for sending that in, man. And uh, if you come across anything that you feel the people could benefit from in the future, make sure you email it in, all right? All right, here's another one. Behind them was something big. Love your attitude. First time, 1980. We're at Lake Tahoe, climbed above the tunnel, going over Highway 50. Manny's Cave Rock to see, watch some jet boat try to break speed record. Mike and I are sitting on a big boulder and we heard two other people coming up. We turned to see one of the tow truck drivers and his wife, but behind them was something really big. Maybe two seconds, and Mike and I looked at each other, looked back, and it was gone. We said nothing. Twenty minutes later, the jet boat made its run, and it disintegrated in front of God and the world. As we left, I went to where something had stood. The boulder it stood near was up to its knee. That boulder came to my waist. I'm 6'6". Six, six. Mike and I never said a word to anyone or each other. And there we go again, right? Not saying a word. Isn't that... It's amazing to me. It's just a very, very peculiar thing to me to read that time and time again. Second, 1986. Driving from Bloomington, Indiana to Columbus, Indiana. After a 12-hour shift at Otis Elevator, doing a change out of overhead crane rails. As I approached the entrance to Brown County State Park, I saw some guy doing jumping jacks in the middle of 46. No one else is on the road. I slowed down, and this guy saw 
scared shitless. Okay, I'll read that one more time. I slowed down, and this guy saw scared shitless. He said something was up. Oh, okay, so this guy he saw was scared shitless. He said something was up on the ridge just to the north, and there, there was busted sandstone all over the road. I pulled a 12 gauge out and started to cross the road, but the scream turned my ass around really quick. Told this kid to jump in the van, and then I smelled it. This kid had shit himself. I almost did too. A big piece of sandstone hit the road and busted. Most slid under the van, but parts came in my window and ended up on the dash. We hauled ass and I saw the pissed off thing in my side mirror. It was big. No reference other than the road, but it was facing us and its arms easily could reach from the center line to the side line of the lane. We stopped at the Circle K Martin. He changed his clothes. I drove him to Greensburg. He didn't get to Columbus until 3.30 a.m. We never said a word. Third, winter of 86-87. Sitting, sitting in a crane, waiting for construction crews south of Story, Indiana, on SR-135, cold and snowy. I looked up and saw someone walking. The sun was just coming up. I fired up the crane. It stopped, took three steps diagonally across the road and into a field and was gone. I measured the height of the road sign that it passed, 10 foot 4, making it over 8 feet tall. Never told anyone, especially that timber framing crew. A year later, I took my dad to see the timber frame we had put up, and it was for sale. The owner said his wife saw something and refused to stay. He was a big-time attorney who had built the timber frame as a retirement home. Wow. Well, 4th, 2013, September. I live on 80 acres west of Columbus, Indiana. I have lots of deer in the woods, also lots of coyote. At near dusk, I heard a coyote going nuts back in the woods. So I grabbed a shotgun with a box in number eight and walked back 300 yards or so from the barn. No coyote sounds, and just followed the tractor path. Getting pretty dark, but the sky was still light. Got to a big cedar and heard a buck snort on the other side of the tree. Then another snort to my immediate right. And then it was like a steam engine starting up, snorts, and I heard footfall to my left. I rammed a shell into the pipe and started backing out. Didn't shoot. Could not see a target. I called my aunt to turn on the security lights of her house, which was closer, and got my uncle to pull his M1 and ammo out of the case. I went to their back porch and settled down. Then went back to my house. I got my spotlight and intended to go, go to the dock and see if there was something on the other side of the lake. I heard a big branch break. Something hit the ground. My aunt hit the security lights, and we both saw an over six foot all black runner moving at an amazing speed back to the big back to the big burn pile. F that shit. I grabbed the Mossberg and slugs and ran to the burn pile when my uncle tried to sight in it. I grabbed the Mossberg and slugs, ran to the burn pile while my uncle tried to sight in with the thirty odd six. We then heard mouth clicking at the burn pile. A crow by the lake, another caw, and mouth clicking to the east behind my barn, and then a huge roar east of the lake. I got the hell out of there. About 20 minutes later, I heard lots of shots to the west and headed to the houses that back up to the property. The cops were there with two armed homeowners. These guys were telling the cops about monsters and shit. The cops just told me nothing was going on. I did run for Congress and never said shit about any of this till after the election. Since then, I found out about river monkeys. If you use my name, just call me Lou. These things are here every September, and they are all over the place. Thanks. Wow. Lou, that is quite the handful of freaking experiences. Unbelievable. Well, hopefully uh, some of those people in the house, or even the cops, um, may be listening to this being read out on this channel right now. Chances are pretty good. And uh, if there's other people out there that want to add to this or have more that they want to share from that area or any area, make sure you send it in. All right? Because we got to talk about this. It's like, we got to stop this thing where everybody doesn't talk. <laughs> you know, we just got to turn that around. It doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, thanks again for sending that in, man. Really appreciate it. All right. It was as tall as the corn. Hi, Steve. Thanks for doing what you do. 
My story is not as interesting as most of the stories you have shared, but oh well, I'll be as brief as I can. In 1967, my dad and older brother took me to see the Patterson film. I was seven years old, son of a logger in the Cascades of Oregon. We talked about Bigfoot off and on, no definite answer one way or another. I, however, was open to the idea. We camped, hunted, and fished, and, and rode motorcycles all over the Cascades. Throughout the years, and in many of these adventures in the mountains, I've seen and heard unexplainable things. Knowing animals on sight and sound like you and I do, we are comfortable and confident in the outdoors. So here we go. In about 1995 or 96, a friend and I were on the way back home from a hunting trip. It was late summer. Just a few miles from town, there are some big commercial cornfields up against the wooded hills that quickly transition into the mountains. The corn was about seven feet tall, maybe a little more. It was late evening as we drove down the road. Neither one of us were talking about anything particular. Both of us are experienced outdoorsmen. Up ahead, something grabbed our attention coming out of the corn. It was as tall as the corn. It was walking upright, all dark or black, with lighter tones on its chest and face. It was looking down as it stepped out of the end of the corn row. As fast as this was happening, I pointed and without thinking said, Bigfoot! Just as I would have said, Buck, if it was a deer. Bull, if it was an elk. Or bear, not. He looked surprised, straightened up, did about face, then disappeared back into the cornfield. We drove on for several minutes and said nothing to each other. Then Ron looked around at me and said, <coughs> Then Ron looked at me and said, What did we just see? I replied, I'm not sure, but I'm going back. <coughs> I replied, I'm not sure, but I'm not going back without a bigger gun. We went at home mostly in silence and didn't go back. 2010. I was elk hunting high in the Cascades in the Three Sisters Wilderness. My friend and I had split up that morning at daybreak. I worked my way up and back into the mountains. I was making my way up a shallow draw. It was full of big timber, small trees, and some underbrush. It had rained some, so it was very quiet. There was good elk sign. I worked my way up the game trail to the top of a finger. As I neared the top, it opened up. So I stepped off the trail with my back to a seven to eight foot fir tree. As I stood there, I just felt odd. I blew it off and stayed there anyway. It was a great spot and I wasn't going to leave until I was ready. So I'd been there for about 10 minutes when, when from behind me came a deep guttural growl. It reverberated through my chest. Never been afraid of anything, especially when I had my 338, 378 Weatherby with me. But I must say, every muscle in my body froze. What went through my mind was, what the F was that? <clears throat> then, whatever that was, it's right behind me. Wind is in my face, no scent. I was thinking, I need to move. I looked down at my safety. With all my might, I made my thumb move forward and pushed the safety off. My gun was across me, right hand on the grip and trigger, the forearm and the bend in my left arm. I knew I had to turn and face whatever was there. Turning my body was like turning in thick mud. I had to force myself and my brain kept saying, turn, 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 and be ready to defend yourself. Steve, I was ready to shoot as I turned, but as I came around, there was nothing there. I was expecting to see something big, but nothing. Since then, I've done tons of research, watched videos, and listened to your follower stories. There were plenty of places to hide and watch me in that draw. I was looking for something big. It never occurred to me to look for something hiding. I stayed for a few more minutes, got my shit together, and moved on hunting. I've always believed the best way to get over a fear of things to go through it, conquer it, and move on. And now I live in the mountains of Idaho, and I'm still more than ever enjoying the great outdoors. But I'm now more aware. I investigate and question things often. We have lots of wolves, black bears, cougars, and now grizzlies, so it keeps a person sharp. Feel free to share. You may need to edit, but please tell it like I said. I've tried to share my experiences with you the way they happened. I pride myself on details so a person can see, feel, and smell my experience. Craig Walsh, retired guide and entrepreneur. Craig, absolutely appreciate you taking your time to send that into us, all right? And uh, that's so good that you kept on hunting and, and stayed with your passion for the outdoors. I, like myself, I have, and I know many other people that have as well, but sadly, I know probably more people that have had to have dropped it altogether because they just couldn't deal with what they saw, right? Which is the shitty deal, and which is why we're here today. But anyway, um, I gotta get going here. Our big move is starting in less than two weeks, and it's 
going to be just an absolute shit show. And I got to get trailer lights fixed and some things and get some work done. And then hopefully this week I'm going to go back up top of the mountain. Oh, back where I, I possibly filmed that shadow or whatever it was back in the timber. And I'm going to set up the camera exactly where it was. And I'm going to walk up to that tree in the timber and videotape it and see what it looks like. Why not, right? But anyway, everybody be safe out there. And uh, if you want to get off your chest, you got something that can help the people, make sure you send it in. See you later on.